Good morning. Welcome to Bible Study at Grace Lutheran Church in the School. Great to see all of you here live in person, and thank you for all of you who will be uh, joining and watching later. Let's pray and get started in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for your servant Luke, who by the Holy Spirit wrote uh, both uh, the gospel that bears his name and Acts, uh, which we'll be studying later. Bless us with wisdom by your spirit through your word as we read that we may learn and grow and uh, not only not only know you better, but be able to communicate uh, your truths to others. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take another now look at the Magnificat, at some elements contained theologically um, in this psalm, a beautiful canticle. My soul magnifies the Lord. Um, the soul always was understood by the ancients as the core of who you are, the seat of who you are. So um, this is not just an intellectual recognition of who God is kind of a a thing, and that's not something I, I don't think that's something that would necessarily have even occurred to them. That's more of a modern thought, post enlightenment rationalism kind of a thought to separate those things. My being would be another way. My being magnifies um, the Lord. Lord is another word for master, so it uh, designates one who has rightful authority. The Lord and my spirit. And here, soul and spirit are used interchangeably, just as another way of expressing the same thing. Um, you know, uh, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Isn't that an interesting way to talk about God in the context of the coming Messiah? In God, my Savior. Um, that is done, for example, in the Psalms. There are several references to God, my Savior, uh, God being a Savior. But here in the context of what the angel has said to her, Mary, at least at this point, clearly knows there is a connection to the one to be born will be called, you know, the Holy One of God um, being a <clears throat> Savior. At this point, she knows. Later in Mark's gospel, um, she seems not to know, but here she does, uh, which answers the song, Mary, did you know? Of course she did. Uh, the angel had just spoken to her. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, he has, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Something that always intrigues me is the amount of time the Bible spends on directing attention to the humble and the lowly. Um, Deuteronomy 14 and 15 go into great detail about the poor and caring for the poor. James writes in his epistle, religion that is pure and faultless is this, to take care of the orphan and widow in their distress. In the prophets, um, Yahweh hammers on Israel for not taking care of the poor, even using the court systems to grab their land and things like that. Um, it's just a constant recurring theme, cover to cover, uh, that the humble and the lowly um, are to be regarded highly. Um, he's looked on the humble estate or situation of his servant, she's referring to herself, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. This and this again, this is not spoken in um, in a lack of humility, but rather in sort of astonishment. You know, it's focused on God because of what God has done, is doing, and has done. The generations will call me blessed. Um, there's also a tie-in to the promise to Abraham that all nations will be blessed through him. And you see this, this blessing cascading down through time, blessed in the Messiah, and it just keeps rolling and rolling. So all generations 
um, ties to that promise. We'll call me blessed. For he who is mighty, that's a constant recurring theme also for God. And we, uh, a lot of our prayers in the church begin with almighty God, you know. Yeah. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. There's an interesting use um, of that, has done great things for me. When the, the promise is a future promise, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. He's speaking of it in terms of it already happening because God is timeless. He exists above and beyond time. And she's, of course, including God's provision and all the wonderful things that God has done for her. But she's sort of in a very kind of a prophetic sense, uh, proclaiming a future event as though it has happened. Um, she's that sure of it coming true. She trusts. Yeah. Holy is his name. To be holy is to be set apart, to be pure. Um, today in the sermon upstairs, we're going to talk about um, the Battle of the Temples, the, the Old Testament temple system and Christ as the new temple, and the battle as it's playing out in the stoning of Stephen. Um, God didn't create the universe with a temple in it. Creation was his temple. We defiled it. <clears throat> So he made a set-apart place, a sanctuary, a set-apart place that reminds us of our sin, that reminds us of our separation that we caused, that reminds us that he is holy and undefiled so that in this broken, sinful world, he's got to have a set-apart place, but also to point us true toward a, a better future where there'll be a new heaven and a new earth without a temple. Because God and the Lamb, as Revelation says, Revelation 21, God and the Lamb are the temple. Uh, so we'll get to that. But holy is his name, set apart, pure and undefiled by its very nature. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. One of the five main sacrifices God established for Israel to keep um, was a grain offering to remember his mercy that he provides all good things for them. Um, and that thread of mercy extends cover to cover in scripture. The Proto Evangelium, the first gospel, was the promise of God that the seed, one day, the seed of woman will crush the serpent's head while the serpent strikes at his heel. And so God's mercy, um, and it's not just a thread um, running through scripture, but could be said to be the gospel in a nutshell, right? God is mighty. He is sovereign. Those things are true. Those things are important. But God can be mighty and sovereign, and we could still not be saved because he could be mighty and sovereign, but not merciful and say, eh, you messed up, squish. Right. So his mercy is greater than even his sovereignty and, and mightiness or whatever, which, in fact, is why he had the Ark of the Covenant constructed like it was. It was made of acacia wood. The box it was made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. Acacia wood has thorns. Thorns are part of the curse of sin. They remind us that we're sinful. The law, the Ten Commandments were in the box. Ten Commandments condemning our sin in the acacia box, but it's covered in gold. And the lid was not made of acacia wood. It was solid gold. And it was called the mercy seat, where the presence of God dwelt in the tabernacle among his people. Mercy triumphs over justice. The law is in an acacia wood box. The mercy seat is solid gold and covers it. 
There's a lot going on there. And it's all mercy. It's wonderful mercy. Yeah. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. In our times, we don't like to use that word fear. And I've been around <laughs> for conversations where parents have avoided the use of fear with their kids. Like in Sunday school type settings, they've avoided the use of fear. I don't want my child to be afraid of God. Well, you kind of do <laughs> because, right? Because that, it, it, what just popped into my head is that one of the fundamental problems that we have today is that young people have no fear of authority. Um, they're almost raised, well, they're almost brought up as self-raising many adults who are there to be served. And so we enroll them in 57 activities and we chauffeur them around like a golden idol in the back seat that we cart from temple to temple and we make sure their world is bubble wrapped and dipped in Purell and nothing can ever harm them. And then they grow up as fragile, easily broken tyrants and we wonder why. We did that. Isn't yeah. that fear like one of the best teaching tools? Also, I mean, like you learn that you don't stick your finger in the socket because you yeah. learn to be afraid of, ooh, that hurts. What a great point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't stick your finger in the socket. That hurts. Be afraid of that. Don't do that and you'll be fine, right? And that's right. That's how fear works with God. Don't cross him. It hurts. It can quickly, it can end in death, eternal death, and separation from God. So yeah, fear God. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not impossible at all. It's not impossible to understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Like Proverbs says over and over and over. And it's, it's not, those aren't contradictory things to say fear God and God is merciful, Right? Because the fear is, is, has nothing to do with a lack of mercy. The fear has to do with justice. You know, he means what he says. Don't do that. You know, don't, don't eat that fruit. In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. They should have feared that, right? Instead, they didn't, and they wanted to be their own God, and now sin and death have entered the world through that one man, right? So, yeah, we should fear the Lord. His mercy is for those who fear him. When we properly fear God, we respect him. We have a sense of awe and reverence. Um, we are lacking that, I think, in the American church, at least in particular today, um, in a way that you don't see, for example, in Haiti or Kenya. Um, in Haiti or Kenya, when we've gone to church there, they literally wear their Sunday best. It is a very formal thing. And, and if you think about the fact that not so much in the in the urban areas of Kenya, which are, you know, essentially at least second world, if not first world. But in the rural areas, you know, many people still washing their clothes in the creek. And I don't know how they do it. Like in Haiti, they'll have white, white, blindingly white, white, white clothes. You know, the whites, their shirts are white, white, white. I can't get that out of the washing machine here in the U.S. <laughs> no matter how much, you know, you put in there of whatever. And I mean, they and they're... Uh, somehow they're ironed and in, in, increased, and wow, and it can be a billion degrees sweating buckets, and the men are in three-piece suits, and the women are in long dresses. Many of them wear a little doily uh, on, their, on their head and stuff, and, it's, and, the, and they'll go into a, a, you know, a concrete block hut, which is basically a sauna, and worship for three hours. And you almost have to shoo them away to make them go home. You know, and here we can barely get Americans to come into climate controlled sanctuaries and sit on a padded view for an hour. Oh, it's so long. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> there's this sense of awe and reverence um, that they have. And they have materially so little, so, so little. And we'll spend ages praising God for what he's given them. So it's just really a kind of a, we could use some fear of the Lord here. Um, they come into a church and they fall quiet and they sit down. Even the smallest of children sit still for the entire service. Um, they're not running around. They're not. Um, 
and they don't go off to ch children's church, which is just kind of an isolation ward. You shouldn't do that. Um, they, they're right there. And um, I think, you know, we come into the sanctuary and visit and laugh and chat. And I, when I go out for the opening announcements, I have to almost call people's attention. And, you know, they brought their coffee and, you know, whatever, like we're going to a movie. And I just, we've lost that sense of awe and reverence. You know, we're coming into the presence of Yahweh, Lord of hosts. Isn't that important? Shouldn't we be focused? You know, that kind of thing. So I think fear of the Lord is, is an important thing we maybe ought to do more with. Fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. You have that whole idea of the right arm, the sword arm, the power hand, the hand that makes war. You know, God rescued uh, Israel from Egypt with a strong arm and a mighty hand. Yeah. Um, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Isn't that interesting? Phraseology. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. What are the thoughts of their hearts? What do the proud have? What are the thoughts of their hearts? What do you think that is? If you're talking about the proud, I would go with idols. Whatever. Idols. Yeah. Me, myself, and I were the things that I was right in the scheming and the plotting, you know, that's going, what can I do to build me up, you know, and he scattered them in the thoughts of their hearts. You know, he brings that down. Um, he will um, humble the proud, but exalt, you know, the humble. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. You know, and um, yeah, God does provide for all, but we're not talking about physical food here. He's filled the spiritually hungry with good things, and the rich he's sent empty away. The rich have no problem getting their food, so we're not talking about actual food here. We're talking about the word of God and the blessings of God. He has helped his servant Israel. Here talking about the nation, uh, the nation as one. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. There's mercy a second time. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, now naming him Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Abraham being the progenitor of the chosen people genetically uh, and will I hope to remember <laughs> to mention that also because that's a big deal I want to make sure I mention in the sermon um, in as we talk about the battle of the temples um, because there's this mistaken notion today that runs around fundamentalist Christianity in America and I'm just identifying that as a spectrum of people not not dinging it or anything like that just so we can kind of identify who we're talking about there's this idea that, for example, Ezekiel's vision of the temple from chapter 40 to 48, the future temple is something that is yet to be built and that America must stand with genetic Israel and keep that as its own country and eventually help rebuild the temple because, you know, the temple has to be there so Jesus can return and rule for a literal millennium and a literal geographic location there and da 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 um, and what one of the things we're going to talk about is that the children of Abraham were the chosen people, genetically descended from Abraham, were the chosen people. The entire point of the ministry of Jesus, and you will see this played out in the opening chapters of Acts, is to explode that out. So that now, and this is in Romans 4 and Galatians 3, now the children of Abraham are children by faith. So we'll see the church explode from the old temple restricted, if you will, to genetic Israel in a geographic location. We'll see that explode out to a non-geographic church of all nations. So that's the new Israel. More on that is coming uh, in the sermon. Is that the issue with 
where you, know, you have the whole thing with your I'm not the right word isn't coming to me, but your your Jewish folks who don't want to accept that Christ has come and that's all that happened because they want to maintain that it's still genetically that, their that's birthright. An of it. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's an element of I've actually talked to people who said that. Yeah, in Florida, I should mention some background. In Florida, where I, I was first 11 and a half or 12 years of ministry was in Florida, where over toward Miami, that side of the second church. There's a lot of Jewish people retired from New York. We called it New York enough. <clears throat> and, and people would say things like, you know, uh, if you talk about the American South, they would say, well, don't call this the South. The South stops at the northern border of Florida. Um, but it was a very heavily Jewish area. And I literally had people say, right, yeah, that um, no, um, they're, they're expecting a uniquely Jewish, genetically Jewish Messiah for a uniquely genetic Jewish people, and they're going to wait on him. Yeah, that does come into play. And it sort of stymied me because I had never thought about that before. I don't have that perspective to think about it. So to kind of hear somebody, I, I would never have expected that. <laughs> and to hear somebody literally say that, I was like, I, 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 uh, you know, and then you kind of proceed with the word of God. That's your basis and your starting point, And it's the only thing that has the power to change hearts anyway. But yeah, it was like when I first heard that, and I heard it more than once, but when I first heard it, I was like, wait, what? I didn't expect that. But yeah, yeah, it, it really very much in some cases is a, is a very genetic thing. You can think of it like you have children and, and, and say like they, they, you give them something really cool and it's theirs. And then you're like, let's go share this with everybody else. And they're like, no. No, <laughs> not happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the birth of John the Baptist. Oh, any questions about the Magnificat? It's one of my favorite canticles in the Bible. Um, and I think, you know, Mary here um, is, is quite, quite an example of how the average Christian should respond to God's mercy. Of course, she's responding to an extraordinary event. But I mean, kind of we should pop up in the morning with this. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I, I thought it might be worth observing, and I don't know if you already maybe did, but, um, you know, her, what she says is so close to what Hannah said. Yeah, that, that, yeah last week we went through the whole Hannah story. Right, exactly. Yeah. That it is, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, I guess it doesn't really say, you know, if she just kind of pulled this up, but it seems to me that she is a very good, faithful Jewish woman. Right. And oh, so yeah. she knows yeah. Hannah, she knows the situation and she says, wow, this, the, you know, I've read something like this before. Yeah. And I, th I, so I, would, similar. I would suggest that it is a, an expression from the word of God yeah. uh, for that same moment. You know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, it, does, it doesn't really say well and recalling Hannah, she, whatever, right. but it seems to me that that is a, right. um, same saying to God, the yeah. kind of thing is already something. Yeah. Here you have um, two women of, of humble estate, both of them in, in you know, um, Hannah's was more desperate, but very humble estate facing the birth of a firstborn son, firstborn son dedicated to God. And there are all of these great parallels. And uh, that's right, as we looked at Hannah's canticle last week and compared them and went line by line, um, there are so many features uh, that are just right on, you know. And I think also this is a great place to mention that I think sometimes Christianity is, and it's really only in, mo in modern, I don't, uh, not modern, philosophically modern, but Temporary, you know, in terms of time and temporality now, in our times, I think Christianity and the Bible in general is, and it's wildly unfair, is unfairly tagged with being, you know, this misogynistic, you know, male-led about men thing. 
when you have these brilliant shining lights like Mary, like Hannah, like Ruth, like Esther, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on, you know, um, the, 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 uh, the very ministry of Jesus was essentially funded by a group of women. You know, who's at the cross? The women. Who's at the tomb? Women. You know, the, the yeah. And it, so it's, it's really galling. In one sense, it's really galling to hear people talk about the Bible and about Christianity that way when it's completely untrue. And it's also a... Um, you know, it's also, uh, it draws attention to our politics. That's really what it is. It's a, a taking an essentially political view of a religious situation. Um, and it also goes to how biblically illiterate our society is today, that we don't know this better and should, you know, kind of a thing. All right. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So if Mary goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth, who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist, and then remains with her about three months, what was she there for? The birth of John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? That is super, super cool. Yeah, and so she would have been herself about three months pregnant when John the Baptist was born. Mary would have stayed there and helped her cousin, you know, who was a much older lady, you know, have, have her child, man. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. Mercy again. Look at this dripping with mercy. And they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Just a brief comment about numbers. Um, the Hebrews did not have a zero concept, so they started with one. So you, when you hear things in the New Testament, like eight days later, it's actually a week later. So it's a week later. Um, they came uh, to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. That was a very important, in fact, and it was very, it's very important in American culture, even all the way up into the past couple of generations. Now, people don't really do that anymore. Some do, but I mean, by and large, it also was incredibly important until about a generation or two ago to name your child after biblical figures. And that's, that's, not, that's not done anymore, really. Uh, either. Um, that part is sad, but also again telling. It's kind of a commentary on our on our culture. No, we just put sounds together and make up names. Yeah, here in Utah, right? Yeah, there is an incredibly funny YouTube video about Utah names. Um, yeah, someone, <laughs> someone told me I just had moved here and had the hardest time understanding names and then try to spell it and forget it. You know, that's and, um, and somebody said, I think what they do is they take the father's first name and the mother's first name, and half of each, and put them together. And then they come up with, I, yeah, I, it's, but anyway, it's a really, really funny video that two, uh, so, uh, two or more lady, young ladies have made about their child's name. Oh, it's hysterical. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, and so none of your, um, none of your relatives is called John. Um, no, he should be called John. And they said, remember your relatives. Uh, verse, um, what is it, 52, 62? The numbers are teeny tiny, 52. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Now, isn't that interesting? Why is that interesting that they made signs to his father? Why is that interesting? What was his punishment for not believing? What did he speak? Struck dumb. So why don't they just talk to him? Yeah. It sounds like maybe deafness came with it, maybe deaf and dumb. I, I don't know, but isn't that interesting? I actually think it's one of those things where, because it's happened, you know, where it's like, well, I, you know, I, I can hear fine. I can't, you know, like the people are just like, hey, you know, or, or like when somebody doesn't speak a language and they tend to talk louder. Hey, it's me. I'm here. 
you're like, I, I don't actually speak English. You know, like you're, you're yeah. addressing the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's sort of a funny little moment in life myself. And yeah, like, yeah. The first and thing I, he says is like, <laughs> and I've noticed here that the study Bible Dodge is commenting on it, <laughs> you know, but it's this funny little detail um, that's there. Yeah. Inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And uh, the study notes here say that would have been a board with uh, covered with wax that could receive letters made with a stylus. So it's an early etch -a sketch, I guess, where you could remelt the wax and have and you could start over. I, I don't know. Study Bible says he was unable to speak. It doesn't say here. It says speak. I know, right? Isn't that right? Right? And they're like doo, 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 making signs. They're like, um, he can still hear unless he can't, or unless it's like you said. It's just maybe it's just oh, he can't speak. I'll make something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's kind of interesting. His name is John, and they all wondered. I mean, this was culturally kind of a surprise thing you just kind of didn't do that so they're like what is up and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed it doesn't say he could suddenly hear <laughs> and he spoke blessing god and fear came on all their neighbors and I just point this out again to show a cultural difference. The ancients had an, kind of an automatic level of fear and reverence for God that's lacking today, at least in American culture, where we ah, my buddy Jesus. He's a hipster Jesus. He's cool. You know, um, I'll never forget the internal struggle, you know, of my first... Um, the first time in worship in Florida when somebody came to church in, um, you know, the flowered, ridiculously flowered shorts and flip-flops and t-shirt, which was normal for that culture, but it stopped me in my tracks. And, and as I, uh, 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 you know, cause it was, and I think, I think that's, you know, part of the, like, his name is John, and they all wondered. You know, I was, I was like, you know, kind of marveling at this thing that was uh, so normal for them. Now it turned out that they had literally just come back from a vacation, and they had been at the beach, and they sort of drove all night and went straight to church rather than stopping at home and being late and all of that. But um, it was a jolt, and then of course later on we had people come that way because that was cool. Yeah, in Florida, that was that was fine. Jesus doesn't care how I come to church. That's what they say, right? I don't think that's the case, actually. I don't think that's a fair statement. Jesus doesn't care how you come to church. Yeah, if you're coming disrespectful, yeah, I'd say he does. Um, God's instructions about the tabernacle are, are like super specific, right? You bring what kind of sacrifice is the only kind of sacrifice you're allowed to bring to the temple? The best of the best. What are the materials God ordered the tabernacle to be built out of? The best of the best. When Solomon constructed the temple, Israel by that time was a superpower, wealthy and, and strong. What did they make the temple out of? The best of the best, right? Cain and Abel um, had, had an issue, right? Because Cain wanted to be all casual with his buddy Yahweh and not offer the Best of the best. Ah, God doesn't care what kind of, As long as I make some kind of offering. Nope. <laughs> yeah, so um, now, obviously, for people who, when you come to church, you come in what you have. And if whatever that is, you come, come to church. You know, don't neglect the assembly. Come to church in that. So you're, you're not more holy because you show, because you demonstrate display reverence but there is an honor reverence that i i believe is required by the circumstances I and mean, if you went to and maybe some people would i can't imagine it if you went to a dinner at the white house would you show up in flip-flops and board shorts and a t-shirt because hey we're buddies you know i mean would you would you go to a, a formal dinner at the white house and and 
carry in your Slurpee and bucket of popcorn. I just, yeah. I mean, there is at least one biblical moment in which Yahweh seems to have something to say about your attire in his presence. And that's when he asked Moses to take off his shoes. Yeah. He doesn't ask. He right. Commands. He commands. Yeah. You're standing on holy ground. Yeah. 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 And I would never want anybody, because um, I've been there, I would never want anybody to feel terrible because what they can afford is materially so much less than what someone else can afford. I think everybody bring your best, whatever that is. It's because it's not about the material. It's about the attitude of, of the heart. And I think an attitude of the heart that is casual about worship is casual about God. Um, I've always said, it took a while to figure this out, but I've always said from that time forward, that how people treat a pastor is indicative of what they think of God. You know, when, when people chew me out or are rough or disrespectful toward me, it's not really about me. They actually, and what, that's what gets me is they actually think that way about God. You know, when they're, when they're angry with something I've preached faithfully, they're angry with God. And that's where I, I get so concerned, and I really want to try to reason with them from Scripture, and I really want to try to show them what God has to say about this. And in some circumstances, they will not hear it. And it's just so shocking to me. It's one thing when the world acts like the world. It's another, and it's pretty painful um, to a pastor, pretty painful when people calling themselves Christian behave in a worldly way and 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 then when presented with that choose that actively over the alternative uh, is 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 a rough thing i don't go through that a lot but but more than well zero would be ideal but <laughs> but but from time to time encounter that and usually it will be centered on some social, culturally, cultural social point. Uh, it's going to, for example, it will have something to do with a sermon that touches on homosexuality or gender identity, something like that. Because when you poke somebody's idol, they'll come roaring out in defense of that idol. Um, Christians will defend God right? Pagans will defend their God. But to, to, to encounter, and again, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen, to encounter people posing as Christians who actually have another God, and then finally are willing to admit it. That's wow. That's, it's kind of rough. And the pastor doesn't really yeah. try to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's going to keep people up and get more and more. And it's going to get worse and worse as the days grow shorter toward, shorter toward, yeah, the return of Christ. Yeah, the hearts of many will grow cold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so his tongue is loosed. And he blessed God and fear came on all their neighbors. It's an appropriate response to what is happening here with Zachary. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Let's pause there because Zechariah's prophecy is rich. It's rich with theology, and we want to carefully go through that next time and not miss some really terrific stake that's in there. So let's pause now and, and close here. Um, and I'd like to ask your opinion. In, in your opinion, do you think the church should do, in general, the church should do more with talking about average everyday people like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. 
Would, would that be helpful? Yeah, we always talk about apostles. You're going, uh, prophets, you're going to talk about apostles and prophets. And I think over time, they almost become their own tier or caste of nobility, of religious nobility. And then you come across a hammer. You're like, oh, real people. Now, the prophets and apostles were real people. They stumbled and did boneheaded things right and left as well. But but Hannah and, uh, and Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and all those folks. Yeah, it seems like it would be good to, to mention them a little more. Okay. All right. Very good. Let's uh, close with prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for the examples we have of regular, everyday, ordinary people in Scripture, people who were not some separate caste of nobility, but were just as, as limited and, and sinful and prone to mistakes and errors as, as we are. It's heartening to see their examples of faith to see them rely not on themselves, but on your mercy. Teach us to do the same, we pray, to rely not on ourselves, but on your mercy. We ask in Jesus' holy name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon, God willing.